Well, hello and welcome back to the Valley Church podcast. I'm here with my buddy Mark, and we are going to continue our conversation on fasting. Last week we started part one, and this week is part two. Last week was also kind of a continuation of our series through the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 16 through 18. And this week is basically the continuation of that topic of fasting Mm -hmm. as we as a church are working on the spiritual practice of fasting. Fasting part two. Sweet. So we'll just refresh a little bit. So Matthew 6, 16 through 18 was what we introed with, and that was just basically fasting uh, is something you shouldn't do to be noticed by other people. You should do it uh, for your relationship with God, to be closer with him. And so to sum that all up, we should fast, but do it for the right reasons. Sounds good. All right. So this week we're going to go into what those reasons have been in the Bible. Cool. So as I was researching, I actually realized how much fasting was in the Bible. I I don't know why I've not noticed the word fasting or a mention of not eating or drinking water a lot of a lot of times in the Bible, but I missed it before. Um, so this was very eye opening for me as I was researching and just really cool. So if you're like me and you didn't realize how much fasting existed, it's okay. It, it happens sometimes, but that's why we're here and we're working through this together. So Scott McKnight has this helpful diagram and A equals this sacred moment and B equals fasting and C is the results. And he created this diagram not because uh, it's super complicated, but because a lot of times we go to B first and we go, okay, Mm -hmm. I'm going to fast to get a result. And Mm -hmm. uh, when in actuality he says it's more important to start with the sacred moment, this uh, yearning for God or a a moment that you want to have with God, be in his presence, what have you, and then go, and because of that, then go to fasting and then go to and then you get the results of that, but not necessarily trying to do the fasting first to get oh. the results and then hoping, oh, I get this sacred moment out of it. So Interesting. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I've never ho- heard that before. I, like I have not heard it either, and I thought it was super valuable. And as we read these scriptures that we go into, I think it's extremely helpful. So, it re- If I might add, oh, yeah. it reinforces the concept that the spiritual disciplines are not um, ends in and of themselves. Mm-hmm. They are means to an end. They're how we train ourselves to be more like Jesus. And so fasting for the sake of fasting is not what we're after. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's for the sacred moment and then the result of what God does in us after that. And so yeah, for I sure. love that. I do too. So uh, there's... I'm only going to talk about like a few. They're all kind of wrapped together, which is kind of complicated because it's hard to have just isolated subjects with fasting because they kind of intermingle a little bit because we're going to so talk about... So all the about... circumstances that people fasted in the Bible, they kind of mingle together? And yeah, they could okay. be... They could they kind of bleed over into each other just because gotcha. God's way bigger than just one little subject here. So sure. I, we're going to talk about repentance, grieving... Uh, knowing God and pleading to him or asking him that type of thing. Those are the four that we're going to look at. Those are the four we're going to look at today. Fasting for the purpose of repentance, grieving, knowing God, and then pleading for something. Pleading for something. Yes. Okay. Okay. So for repentance, uh, Scott McKnight, you're going to hear this name a lot throughout this whole uh, little talk here uh, because he's... He's a really smart guy, and he has a lot of good thoughts on uh, fasting. So he says this, The most common form of fasting in the Bible will surprise us. The most common form of fasting is in response to the kind of sacred moment when Israel is called to confess sin. I call this kind of fasting body turning. So his thought is we confess with our mouth. We repent in our hearts. So uh, a physical, like, Denying yourself of food is a way for our whole body to engage in repentance, wow. which is a, a really cool thought. And like we sort of do something similar with worship. We raise our hands to show like I'm 
surrendering to you, Lord. Like, and we kneel to kind of our uh, as a physical heart posture, so to speak. So, mm-hmm. this is something similar where your body can participate in the act of repentance, which is that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Arthur Wallace says, uh, mourning over personal sin and failure is an indispensable stage in the process of sanctification, and it is facilitated by fasting. So here's a couple uh, examples in Scripture. Uh, 1 Samuel, really cool book. You should read it. Uh, but in the beginning, the ark was stolen by the Philistines. They Philistines are all throughout the Bible, and... They're like the arch nemesis. <laughs> and uh, at this point, uh, they stole the ark. And the ark, not just a box, not just uh, a cool symbol even, but the ark was the presence of God. So uh, when Eli, he was a judge of Israel, he hears that the ark is stolen. He falls over like, and then dies, breaks his neck and dies. So the Philistines, while while they have the ark, are basically being tortured by God. All these plagues and weird things are happening, and they're like, okay, I think we can do this. And then eventually they're like, no, we can't. We got to give this thing back. So they give it back, and then uh, the Lord allows the ark to go back to Israel, and all the people of Israel turn back towards the Lord. So we have this little this scene here, and Samuel Uh, the prophet says this. He says, Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to the Israelites, If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and their Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with you, f- uh, intercede with the Lord for you. When they have assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted, and there they confessed, we have sinned against the Lord. So you have all of God's people collectively fasting together as this act of repentance because uh they blew it. They were worshiping other gods, so they threw them all out, and part of their repentance was fasting. So a second example we have is with in the book of Ezra. So God's people are coming out of exile. They were told not to marry outside of God's people, but even the priests and Levites were marrying outside of God's people, and Ezra realizes this and goes into this time of mourning. Uh, He tears his tunic, pulls out some of his beard hair even, and he goes into this little room, and while he was there, he didn't eat food, he didn't drink water, and he begins to mourn and basically repent for his involvement with uh, the people of God. Example number three is in the New Testament with Saul. Uh, He is still breathing murderous threats. He's actively persecuting uh, Christians, and he's on this path to continue doing that. So Jesus appears to him, and Saul becomes blind and then does not eat or drink for three days. And Scott McKnight says this about uh, that section of scriptures. He says, So sacred was his moment of seeing Jesus. So powerful was his realization that he had been opposing the very work of God. So potent was his apprehension of his sin. And so deeply did he sense God's grief over his sinfulness that Saul repented with an absolute fast for three days. Boom. Hmm. And then example four which is the one that uh, all the teachers of the law and Pharisees, Sadducees that Jesus is referencing in chapter 6 of Matthew uh, is the Day of Atonement. So this example is in Leviticus 23, and it goes from 26 to 32. It says, The Lord said to Moses, The tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present 
a food offering to the Lord. Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement. When atonement is made for you before the Lord your God, those who do not deny themselves on this day must be cut off from their people. I will destroy from among their people anyone who does not work on that day, or I will destroy from among their people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Wherever you live, it is a day of Sabbath rest for you, and you must deny yourselves. From the evening of the ninth of the month until the following evening, you are to observe your Sabbath. So this is kind of like a combo of spiritual disciplines here, in a sense. Uh, We have Sabbath, but we also have this phrase, you must deny yourself, which is commonly uh, interpreted as a uh, a fast. So, Interesting. Um, yeah, I did not realize that at all. But the again, Scott McKnight has something to say. He says the Israelites were told to make their life uncomfortable for an entire day in order to bring their entire person into harmony with the gravity of sin and the need to turn from sin toward God. God thought this was so important that Israel was summoned to enact the Day of Atonement every year. So every year, Day of Atonement, they would Sabbath, but they would also not eat during the Sabbath. Okay, so I have some questions about this. So many questions. some thoughts. A, I didn't know where this was going to go today, and I'm. this is really good. Great stuff, Mark. So I could see some people thinking, and I'm one of them, thinking the concept of um, fasting out of as a, a physical kind of response to um, coincide with repentance um, could make someone feel like, is this kind of like self-punishment mm. to pay for sin? Which the Bible is definitely not saying that. But I could see how someone might go there that like, oh, I messed up and I need to kind of um, say – sorry to God by starving myself. Yeah. How might, how should we think about it? How is it different than that? Cause that's, that's not right, but yeah. how should we think about it? So that would be similar to the, the diagram we showed before the doing a fast uh, mm-hmm. for a result, which if that was your mindset, entering a fast is like, Oh, I've done wrong. I should punish myself by fasting. Mm-hmm. And then kind of like your own atonement. I will punish myself by not eating. And then I'll, I don't know, feel better about myself or I'll be right before God. Uh, But again, it's about a wanting to be in the presence of God, wanting uh, the sacred moment, the sacred moment with God. And because of that sacred moment, because of the acknowledgement of that, we go to fasting Mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's not necessarily about the atonement for it. The the fast is more of uh, a facilitator of Hmm of that not not the end all that we should just do it because it helps us atone for our sins yeah so the next one is fasting to change god's mind now this is a a subject where it's easy to go i'm going to fast to get a result but again this is uh the hopefully the examples help flesh this out a little bit but um these uh wanting to seek that uh, sacred moment first. So keep that in mind. But in Joel 2, uh, I'll just read it. So in Joel 2, it says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offering and drink offerings for the Lord your God. So we have this section here where the Lord is calling for his people, return to me, stop doing what you're doing uh, with weeping and mourning and fasting. And uh, Joel says, hey, who knows? He might turn. He might relent. Let's do it. Let's change God's mind. And it's just an example from scripture where uh, the right 
heart mindset, even body like alignment with that has something and it's kind of, it's hard to understand, but it does something with our pleas to, to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about, um, the concept of mourning, how our, uh, Western culture, Americans particularly, we are not a culture that mourns well. In fact, I think we try not to. It's not to say that things don't make us sad, but there are other cultures, not that I'm an expert, but from what I understand, where mourning is like a dedicated time period where Mm. a loved one passes and you might dress differently or you have a dedicated period of mourning. Like we see that in the scriptures uh, in the Old Testament particularly. There's periods of mourning for when things happen. And what I see here in Joel and and other parts of the Old Testament is that uh, there is a time to intentionally feel those feelings, Mm -hmm. whether it's repentance for sin, uh, again, in this case in Joel 2, return to the Lord with all of your heart. And then I, I kind of think each of these uh, fasting, weeping, and mourning kind of describes what it means to return to the Lord with mm-hmm. all your heart. They're kind of like synthesizing and explaining that happens in like the prophetic literature. So return to the Lord with all your heart by fasting, weeping, and mourning. So intentionally acknowledging where we've gone wrong. And, yeah. Um, I've never fasted to do that. (laughs) Neither have I. Uh, But the fast helps your heart and your mind get there, I think. One more example. It's in 1 Samuel. It's uh, in chapter 1. Hannah uh, really wants to have a son. And she goes to the Lord fasting and praying and pleads with the Lord to have a son. Uh, and she does. It works. And she dedicates him as a Nazarite, and that child would be Samuel, who the book is of pretty Samuel. Legit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty legit. So uh, Scott McKnight, who we've mentioned many times, uh, you should go read his book because if you really want to know about fasting, he's got even cooler thoughts than I can just summarize here. His book is called Fasting, right? Yeah, his book is called Fasting. What a creative title. <laughs> what a creative title. So he says, fasting along with our prayer requests is not some kind of magic bullet to ensure the answer we want. Fasting doesn't reinforce the crumbling walls of our prayers like a flying buttress, nor is it a manipulative device. We fast because a condition arises, what we are calling the sacred moment. That leads us to desire something deeply. Hmm. So fasting is not a way to manipulate God into giving uh, you what you want, but it does show this the seriousness of the request uh, that something is happening not just in your mind, but also with your body as yeah. you plead before the Lord to change His mind. You stopped reading a quote, but I want to read the next sentence because it's very good. Okay, we fast because our plea is so intense that in the midst of our sacred desire. Eating seems sacrilegious. That's good stuff. That's very good stuff. Okay, moving on. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> I feel like I have a million Scott McKnight quotes. <laughs> so we fast to repent. We fast when we plea to change God's mind. And we fast to know God. Hmm. So again, this is kind of intertwined with some of those other ones, but I think uh, that as you fast, uh, as you're connecting maybe with your sin or connecting with a plea that you're asking, you are also learning more about God, and he's probably revealing more about himself to you in the midst of that. Scott McKnight says, by denying oneself the pleasures of food, one can achieve holiness, pure love, and union with God. Many in the history of the church, especially from the 4th to 16th centuries, believed union with God was nearly impossible to achieve without rigorous fasting and solitude. So in an effort to experience God more directly, many fasted intensely. So uh, a lot of old church fathers believed fasting was super important 
in order to to know God even more than you already do. And we see that in Daniel here. It says in Daniel 9, uh, verse 3, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. So um, Daniel, uh, another story where the they were basically held captive and he's pleading with the Lord going like, hey, when's this going to end? When's this going to stop? And he goes to the Lord, prays, fasts, goes sackcloth and ashes. He didn't tear his beard out like uh, the other guy, but an angel comes to him, Gabriel, and comes to Daniel and explains things to him. Uh, it, I like how the scripture says it gave him insight and understanding to some of the plans, some of what was happening in the future, the uh, the 77s, uh, yeah. kind of a complicated uh, revelation of things that were to come. But um, It's about Daniel, but it's also not about Daniel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's a little hard to understand, but uh, go read it. It's really cool, but... Daniel was able to learn more about God and his plans through fasting, which is pretty darn cool. Um, in the next example, we have Jesus, who the is... man himself. Who is... Who is Jesus? He needs no ex- <laughs> He needs no introduction, <laughs> like, I feel where are you like. Where you going to go with that? Uh, yeah, what am I going to say? He is Jesus. Yep. Um, Jesus fasts for 40 days in the wilderness, so this is a super well-known set of scripture. Uh, I've actually read this more and heard it applied more as a reason to memorize scripture and not that <laughs> Jesus actually fasted. I don't know why, uh, but... We, we skipped that part we because skipped we that like part. food. <laughs> we like food, um, but Jesus goes into the wilderness. Uh, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was very hungry. John Mark Comer from The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness because it was there and only there that Jesus at the, was at the height of his spiritual powers. It was only after a month and a half of prayer and fasting in the quiet place that he had the capacity to take on the devil himself and walk away unscathed. So uh, fasting was a part of this preparation to basically take on the devil. Mm-hmm. He was alone in this wilderness, not eating anything for 40 days, and uh, being with God the Father in this desolate place, and the devil tempts him. Mm-hmm. But he uses scripture, his knowledge of who God really is, God the Father, and is able to walk away. Yeah, so fasting was part of his prep that led him to a place where he was close to, one with the Father, and uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so fasting to repent, fasting to plea with God, fasting to change God's mind, and fasting just to know God. I like mm-hmm. those. Those are great. So what's next? What's next is what could this look like for everyone? Uh, because uh, not all of us are in the middle of being conquered by Philistines or uh, going off into the wilderness for 40 days uh, because, or going up to a mountain and completely fasting for 40 days, food and water. So we're not exactly like all these guys from the Bible, but I believe that there is some part of this that God wants us to participate in. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to say again, that fasting is like this prescription for us, for our soul to perfectly align with the Lord. Uh, But it's not, it's, Jesus is uh, what we need. Yeah. And again, uh, fasting is a way to help facilitate that, but we need to seek out that sacred moment uh, and just be with God. That should be our first uh, mm-hmm. first desire and what we want the most, not just doing something to hopefully get a result or uh, 
plea with God that we want like a Tesla because that would be really cool. And if I fast long enough, maybe I'll get it. But uh, we want to seek that sacred moment with God. That could look like regular fasting. Uh, Dallas Willard says, when a person chooses fasting as a spiritual discipline, he or she must then practice it well enough and often enough to become experienced in it because the only person who is well uh, habituated to systematic fasting as a discipline can use it effectively as a part of direct service to God as in times of special, uh, as in special times of prayer and other service. So Dallas Willard says that basically the more you do it, the more effective it is. Yeah. It's a different enough spiritual discipline and certainly for our kind of church, um, community, Mm -hmm. uh, different enough, new enough that it needs to be regular. Perhaps it needs to be regular if it's going to be like a helpful, effective discipline to have. Yeah. Yeah. And as I fasted, the, the first fast I did was, I was useless. It was like, Mm. that was, there was nothing holy about what I was doing. (laughs) I was, there was no sacred moment. (laughs) There's not a sacred (laughs) moment. We'll say that. But the, as I continued to fast and make it more a regular part of my life, then I feel like that's when the Lord was speaking to me more. Or maybe I just got out of my own way and going like, oh, I'm hungry. I was able to push some of those things aside to actually sit back and listen to the Lord in mm-hmm. in the middle of a fast rather than listening to my body. Mm-hmm. Um, so make it a regular part of your rhythm with Jesus. Um, I could look... Well, like in the old days with uh, doing it two times a week. Uh, That might be a lot, maybe one time a week or even one time a month. Or uh, Scott McKnight suggests making Good Friday uh, our new Day of Atonement, where as a group of believers, we go together to celebrate the Lord uh, sacrificing himself on the cross by... Uh, doing a fast together Mm -hmm. and making that our new day to reflect on that and to align ourselves. A fast that you could end with the Lord's Supper? Come on. That's amazing. (laughs) That's amazing. Let's do it. Yeah. We just missed the boat though, man. I know, yeah. (laughs) But uh, usually these fasts were 24-hour periods, uh, similar to like a Sabbath, like sundown uh, to sundown. Um, not you, you would eat your dinner and then you would go to sleep, wake up, not eat breakfast, not eat lunch, and then break your fast in the evening with dinner and Mm -hmm. you'd celebrate, uh, communion probably Mm -hmm. and, um, spend the day, uh, when you would feel a hunger pang to go to the Lord in prayer or, um, just being extra conscious of maybe something the Lord wants to tell you, um, not necessarily uh, seeking Him for anything, but just again that sacred moment, desperately wanting to seek Him and uh, just be a part of that moment with Him. Yeah. Okay, I have some questions. Oh yeah. What would you recommend to someone that has not done this at all? So you gave some options: two times a week, one time a week, once a month. Good Friday, which if that was all we did, it would be once a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, if someone hasn't done this before, what would you just say, based on your experience over the last couple months, what would you recommend to people in our church family to do? I would recommend uh, starting small, okay. honestly. Uh, like I said, my first Sabbath, I went all in. First and, Sabbath or first? Oh, wait. First fast. For my first fast, I went all in. And like I said, I was a whiner complainer. I did not do it very well. So so I suggest starting small and, uh, I guess, would you recommend like once a week or would you recommend once a month or? Ooh, that's a good question. Every day, (laughs) every day. (laughs) I I don't know. I don't know what a good suggestion is Mm -hmm. because the, well, walk us through your, your difficulty in deciding. Yeah. Why not once a week? Well, why wouldn't you start with once a week? I guess maybe I would suggest once a week if you want to get good at fasting, Mm -hmm. but 
it's sort of weird. I, you want to be good enough at fasting, but the point of fasting is not to get good at fasting. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hesitate to say an exact, like, here's a good formula for you, mm-hmm. but I would suggest uh, definitely trying it. Mm-hmm. And if you've never fasted, um, to go for it. And, and as we look in scripture, we see Jesus saying, when you fast, and he doesn't say, you got to do it this many times a week or this many. So I don't, we don't want to be legalistic about it. Mm-hmm. However, uh, I think there are times where we do need that significant repentance in, in our hearts and fasting. That's probably a good time to do a fast. Mm. Um, maybe you're feeling distant from the Lord or mm. something like that. Maybe that's a good time to fast. Uh, obviously, uh, I feel like those are those are different reasons than uh, like you want you're seeking the Lord and mm-hmm. trying to discover more about Him. Mm-hmm. I feel like those are pretty good holy reasons, yeah. <laughs> I suppose, and not not for your own good. Yeah. So maybe try one fast, uh, uh, one one a month, perhaps. Unless you kind of sense that maybe if I'm, I'm kind of picking up on what you're saying, if we, if you think in your life, like you need a sacred moment, um, mm-hmm. whether you're like facing a decision that you have to make or, um, you just like need God to show up like in your marriage or in your friendships or in your finances, like pursuing a sacred moment, um, and allowing fasting to be part of that could be a really great option. Yeah. Yeah. I like that once a month to get you going, Mm -hmm. um, try eating dinner, then nothing the rest of the the night, waking up, not eating breakfast, and then maybe not lunch Mm -hmm. and trying for the full 24. But yeah, I feel like if you stopped and broke your fast at lunch, that is a fantastic start and probably doing more for your, uh, your heart, with Jesus, then you know. Yeah, cool. I love it. And uh, one last thing, uh, we can also do a what's called the diet restriction, and it it has a place for those that maybe aren't able to participate in a full fast of not eating or drinking water or whatever uh, because of their job or health reasons for some reason or another. Uh, but I feel like having an opportunity to have uh, seeking that sacred moment is uh, still there uh, even with a restriction. So, yeah. Cool. Well, I love this, Mark. I loved what you, what you brought us today. I'm excited to try this. And I, I would guess if I was a betting man that we might have some times as a church that we fast, Hmm. Um, whether that's good Friday or, um, where we kind of collective collectively want to see God do something. Um, I mean, we were just talking before we started recording that perhaps this is a time yeah. for a church family to fast with um, the pandemic. Like, uh, not that we <laughs> did anything wrong or caused it or anything like that. Not a not a fasting of repentance, but a, a fasting to plead with God to save us and to heal us and to end what's happening in our world right now. Yeah, yeah, great stuff, Mark. Thank you very much for bringing this to us. And Valley Church, we love you. We miss you. We hope this um, these teachings are um, a blessing to you and encouraging and helpful. And we hope that um, for those of you that are in our communities, I hope that the next couple weeks where you guys talk about this discipline are awesome and helpful. We hope you guys kind of encourage each other and spur one another on to Mm -hmm. these spiritual practices. Yeah. We love you and miss you. See you later. We'll see you later.